think we're good. All right, everybody, we're going to get and get started to honor everybody's time, so thank you all for coming. Uh, let's start in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together this evening. Help us to better appreciate our obligation to vote and to vote with faithful Catholic consciences. Please give us the courage to share the truth in a world that doesn't always want to hear it. Please give us the wisdom and the fortitude in this world so that we can share you with those that we encounter and continue to bless us and bless our families as we deal with difficult situations, not only within our own personal lives, but in our society. And help us to be that light we've been called to be at our baptism and to share you with all those that we encounter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, well, thanks for coming. And so this is a talk I put together right before the pandemic hit. And I was able to give it a couple times, uh, but I've also given the presentation a few times since. Uh, it really is a reminder that elections have consequences. And we see that in our world today every time we turn on the news, when we see what's going on in our world, not only here in Colorado, but in our nation. <laughs> You know, we saw the, you know, uh, we see it in our politicians. And so what we do matters. And when we vote with a faithful Catholic conscience, or if we all voted with a faithful Catholic conscience, the collective we, this world would be a totally different place. Uh, unfortunately, we have people who don't have the courage to speak the truth in the hierarchy of the church and in other positions, but we need to be able to do it. It doesn't give the laity an excuse not to follow the teachings of the church because we have people who, uh, for some reason or another, either don't understand them or have an agenda. So the first thing to remember is, one, voting is a civic duty. We, have a we should be voting. We need to have a voice in the public square. Otherwise, we have no reason to complain, and we just have to go along with what's going to happen. So we need to make sure that our voices are heard. I mean, right now we hear, you know, half the Catholics will probably vote for somebody that's a platform that supports abortion, same-sex marriage, and wants to restrict religious liberty. That's crazy. That should never happen, but that's the world in which we live. The other thing to remember is we have to be registered to vote, and we have to encourage other people to do so. I heard a stat the other day that there's 25 million evangelicals in the country who are not registered to vote. That is a travesty. My guess is there's huge numbers of Catholics, I just haven't found it either. Right? A lot of people like to gripe, but then they don't do what they're supposed to do in order to register. So we need to encourage everybody to register to vote because that, again, is their obligation. We are here to share Jesus Christ, and we don't do it when we don't vote for politicians or we vote for politicians who support things, obviously, other than what the church teaches. So it's a civic duty. And we gotta be registered to vote. It's a requirement for each and every one of us. We hear it through the hierarchy of the church. We know Archbishop just put out a magazine or the cat, Archdiocese just put out a magazine about the threats on religious liberty. Well, you can't do anything about the threats if we're not registered to vote. So we need to make sure not only, but then we have a voice, right? We tell other people, and we have to educate other people on voting. Um, so this is actually, a quote from a long time ago from the uh, Catholic Conference of Bishops that urges all citizens to see beyond party politics and analyze campaign rhetoric and critically choose political leaders. We don't need to worry about personalities, right? People don't like Trump and you can let, like him for his policy, but I grew up in Philly, everybody acts that way, right? Everybody acts like they're in your face, they don't care what you're thinking. They'll use every curse word as an adjective. That's the way people talk, right? So we need to make sure that we understand that we're not voting just because we don't like the way somebody looks or the way somebody talks. What have they actually done? And I'm not gonna tell anybody here who to vote for, but we need to see what have they done and who do they stand for, right? You guys have to figure it out. I'm gonna talk about the policies. I'm gonna talk about what you should use to vote. And I think it's gonna be crystal clear on what we should be doing, right? But life, marriage, and religious liberty are the three foundational issues. But we need to make sure that we understand it's not somebody that we like. It's somebody who's gonna do and fulfill the teachings of the church. 
And we need to make sure that that is something that we hold against every politician. Look, if you're running a business and you hire a bunch of people you like that have no competency, your business is going down the pot. Right? If you hire somebody who might be a little abrasive, but gets the job done and makes money for your company and you know, isn't some kind of moral degenerate, you hire them. You hire the best person for the job who's going to fulfill the mission of that company. Not just because you like them, because if that's all we're going to do, we're going to get exactly what we get right now, which is garbage. We have people who are elected in office who I wouldn't let them watch my dog. So we need to make sure that we understand that it's what they do and what it's not just what they say. Because they'll set, tell you anything, right? They'll change positions 100 times to Sunday. But we need to make sure it's people are fulfilling the promises that they make. Again, if you're from the East Coast, you don't believe anything exists west of the Appalachians, right? You think, you know what? It's that land over there, and we don't care about it. I grew up in that area, and that's exactly how everybody thinks. But that doesn't mean they can't do a job. So whether they're born there or in the South or wherever, we need to look at what they do. Personalities are for the birds. And we need to make sure that that's not what's driving us, not who looks the best, who dresses better in a suit, who stands you know, straighter than the other one. It's who is going to defend those tough teachings of our church and make sure that they hold other people accountable. Right? What, who we elect matters. Again, as we said before, elections have consequences. So we need to make sure it's principles and not personalities. And in, in this world, right, it's all about who looks good and who's doing whatever. The other thing is, I don't care what a celebrity says, I wouldn't listen to any of them. Right? They're all left-wing lunatics, for the most part. And they have no idea how, the real, how real people live or what affects real people. They think, do whatever you want, right? They're the, they're the poster children for relative mor moral relativism. And we need to make sure that we're not listening to what people say. We're not listening to what the news says. We are evaluating people ourselves. We're looking at what they say, right? We spend too much time in this world watching people just go along with the crowd. And that's why we're in the mess that we're in. Uh, Father Sam Moorhead actually was quoted in, in the Denver Catholic back in 2016, and he says, look, the question for me as an individual voter is, how do I cast a vote that God wants me to cast? It is his world, his country, nothing is mine, all, is ulti all ultimately belongs to God. So I would say each one of us, if we're going to cast a vote, imagine Jesus Christ is standing right at our shoulder when we're casting that vote. If we're casting a vote for somebody who promotes abortion, who promotes same-sex marriage, who promotes you know, a hideous agenda, how would we explain to Jesus Christ that this is the person we should be voting for, who goes against all the teachings of the church? Now, it makes it even worse when somebody professes to be Catholic and they have no idea or they totally ignore all the teachings of the church, right? We all know when we say the word Catholic, it's a pretty broad spectrum, right? We don't, I don't even know what that means anymore, right? Who is going to follow the teachings of the church? Because we have politicians on both sides, but mostly on the Democratic side, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden. I mean, you go down the list, right? John Kerry, all these people. I've not, I've not heard one of them defend any of the tough moral teachings of the church, Yet they continue to get elected and they continue to say, well, it's because I'm Catholic. Look, people like to hold John F. Kennedy up as like this icon, right? He ruined it for every Catholic politician. Or what he did was grease the skids for every Catholic politician to say, well, I personally believe this, but I don't want to impose my beliefs on people. It's ridiculous. Why would we vote for anybody who isn't a conviction to their beliefs? Yet people do all the time, right? Just because they say they're Catholic or they say they're this, it doesn't mean anything. We got to see what do they believe and what are they doing. So one of the things we need to understand is, look, they all, every party should have respect for the dignity of the human person, right? We need to live by truth, not false compassion. And that's exactly what we hear from politicians. One of, you know, I think, 
I think I think it's Biden said, you know, he wants to put transgender people in his in his administration. All right, here's the deal. People need to hear the truth, not this false compassion, whether it's euthanasia. You know, we have people who struggle with transgender identity issues, right? They go through, they go through uh, puberty blocking drugs, cross sex hormones, they go through surgeries. Then what we're seeing now is people realize that they made a huge mistake, right? It's too late when you cut off parts, they don't grow back. But what they say almost to a person is, I wish somebody would have told me the truth. I don't know that I would have believed them, but at least I wish somebody would have had the courage to tell me the truth, what I was doing was wrong. So we need to make sure that we have the courage to speak the truth, and we vote for people who are, have the courage to speak the truth and mean it. This false compassion is for the birds, and all it does is lead people further away from Christ, and it creates the havoc and the chaos that we have in our world right now. It makes no sense, but that's what we see, right? They try to shame us, right? We're bigots or haters if we try to tell people the truth. Well, Christ tells us to tell the truth, right? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So if we want to share Jesus Christ, we share the truth, not this false compassion that gets watered down so much because we want everybody to like us. If that's what the politician does, then we should never vote for them. We need to focus on the common good. The common good, look, is strong families, right? And a family is a mother and a father. A family isn't two moms and two dads. A family isn't this polyamory that's going on now where you have multiple people who consider themselves a family. We need people who are gonna defend the family, defend marriage between a man and a woman, right? I think, was it 2013, whatever it was, the Supreme Court came up with the ruling to basically destroy marriage but guess what? Who we elect appoint those people who are going to be on the Supreme Court, right? We see it going on now in our world, right? We have Amy Coney Barrett, who has been nominated for the Supreme Court, replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who how she is being revered when she promoted abortion, transgender ideology. You know, she comes off as this great champion for women. She was actually the opposite. If you just saw, you know, this this past session, she voted in favor for uh, Bostock versus Clayton County that made transgenderism employment law. That you can't discriminate against somebody who's delusional on who the, what their sex is. And so everybody says, oh, that was great for women. Oh, really? What she has done is open the door, and we've already seen it in our society. It'll be the end of women's sports, right? We already see men trying to compete as women. How is that pro-woman? How is it pro woman to have a man in a woman's bathroom with your 16 year old daughter potentially? That's exactly the type of person she was and that's what she voted for. You know, she thinks she's so smart, right? She was, actually Obama went to her in 2015 and tried to get her to retire so that he could put somebody else on the Supreme Court. Her answer was, you're never gonna find anybody as smart as me, right? And she didn't retire. But the wake that she left is a train wreck. But when we vote for people, that's the thing. There's collateral damage. It's the domino effect, right? We need to make sure that we understand that when we vote for somebody, there are ramifications. You know, who do they put in their cabinet? Who are they putting on the Supreme Court? All these things matter. And if they're not pro-family, pro-man and woman, pro-life, then we're going to get the stuff we're getting, right? Where all of a sudden anybody can use any bathroom, right? Hate speech, if you happen to say the wrong words or you don't use somebody's particular pronoun that they want, right? We've had, we've had teachers, high school and in college fired because they're not using the pronoun the individual wants. That's what we have in office now and that's the legacy of the last many years. Even with some of the Republicans who, who put Supreme Court people in there, they put jokes in there. Right? They put people who they thought could get past, and we need to make sure we're going to have people who vet that. Right? We have the responsibility, as Pope Francis says, to participate, as I mentioned before, in the civic life of our nation. Right? It isn't, it, this is not a spectator sport. This is participation. And you know what? You may say, you know what? Nobody's good. I don't want to vote for anybody. Well, then we need to encourage good people to run for office. Because we don't have them right now. Even in our local 
runoffs. I, I live in a district that's a swing vote on the, on the Senate here in the state. I reached out to the re person running as a Republican. I said, hey, come on my show. Let's talk about Proposition 115. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Get a hold of my campaign manager. It's been a month and a half. I've heard crickets. And I've reached out to both. So we have cowards on both sides. Right? We have cowards who are afraid to talk about it because they don't think they'll get elected. Look, Republicans have done a horrible job in the state of Colorado for years. That's why they're in the position they're in. Hey, stick with the moral teachings, defend truth, and if they lose, at least you can look in the mirror. Right, but we have cowards, and we need to hold them accountable. And we need to make sure that's part of our civic duty. Right, go visit them, call them. Right, a lot of them have already been in office. You know, they hold, and I'll go through this a little bit later, you know, they all hold monthly meetings at local libraries or community places. You know how many P Catholics usually show up at those meetings? Zippo. Maybe they get 10 people total. We need to be active in the political process. Our children's futures are at stake. Our grandchildren's futures are at stake. We have a moral obligation to participate because when we don't, we get what we get. Look at, the, look at Colorado right now, right? We have a governor, an attorney general, a secretary of state that all promote abortion and other things, right? They kept abortion clinics open during the pandemic. We were a destination place for people to come kill their children, moms to come kill their babies. They were coming from Texas and all other places. Elections have consequences. So we need to make sure, and I'm, look, I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir here, but we need to remind other people, right? We need to have a develop, we need to develop well-formed Catholic conscience. We need to be true to the teachings of the church. Not cafeteria Catholics, like we pick the ones we like, and the other ones, meh, those are for suckers. No, this is for everyone. And we need not only to understand the teachings, we need to be able to articulate the beauty behind the teachings. Because if we just tell people, that's just because what Jesus says, nobody's going to buy it. Right? They don't want to hear that. We need to be able to talk about why the beauty of the teachings and the why behind the teachings. So that means we have to do stuff. Right? I used to think in college, if I went to bed and put a book on my head, maybe that stuff would seep into my head when I woke up. Never worked. Never helped me on a test. You actually have to study and do stuff. Uh, we need to be able to apply and articulate natural law. Why were we even created? Why are things created? And if I buy a flat screen TV, I could sure use it to hold open my door. That's not the reason the flat screen TV was created. Right? It was to watch, to be entertained, to be educated, not to hold the door open. So we need to be able to use that same logic when we're talking about why were we created? Why were we created male and female? We are not, we are not non-binary, right? We're not, we don't get to pick and choose what we are. What's the beauty of why we were created and what we were created for? Then we need to pray, right? We need to pray for better understanding, not only of the teachings of the church, but understanding of where people are coming from. Why are they saying what they're doing and why do they believe what they believe? We need to pray for guidance, wisdom, courage, fortitude, right? It's tough out there, right? We're sheep sent among wolves. And we got people who want to argue and condemn and call us haters for sticking to the truth. Well, guess what? These are unhappy people. Look at the anarchy going around there. It's a bunch of angry white people, right? All of a sudden proclaiming Black Lives Matter, right? And we saw what happened in New York when a bunch of them got arrested, right? They all came from well-to-do families, right? Never had a care in the world, and they don't like the system. Well, if you don't like the system, you don't need to burn everything down. How about educating yourself and voting, which is what each and every one of us should do. But we do that through prayer and understanding. What is the Lord asking me to do? How is he asking me to vote? How is he asking me to share the truth with people? Because he is each and every one of us. And we need to make sure that we're open so that we spend time in prayer each and every day. Because to leave our homes, to go out into this world without knowing that Jesus is right by us, is a train wreck. 
right? We're going we're gonna to be intimidated, we're going to be afraid to speak up, and we're going to get exactly what we've gotten today, right? A, a world that wants to throw God out and create this utopia that they think is whatever anybody believes is true, right? We have moral relativism. Basically, what we have is cultural Marxism uh, existing in our world today. But that's because we need to make sure that we are equipped when we go out. Right? We need to participate in the sacraments. We need to receive Jesus. We need to go to confession. You know, Mother Teresa used to what, go to adoration an hour a day before she would go out into the slums. And they're like, people are dying, mother. What are you doing? And she's like, look, if I don't fill myself with Christ, I have nothing to give when I go out. We need to think exactly the same way. We need to make sure that we take care of our spirituality, our faith in Jesus. We get filled with Christ so that when we go out, we don't have any fear. And we know what we're sharing. We're sharing the truth. When we're not filled with Christ, we're going to be petrified. And that is going to be no good for anybody because what kind of witness to the faith is fear, right? We need to make sure that, you know, oh, I'm going to lose my job or somebody's not going to like me or a family member is going to disown me. Look, if that's what the truth does, that's what the truth does. You know, Christ showed us exactly the path. And we need to make sure that we are strong enough to do it, but we're not going to be strong enough if we're not spending time in prayer, partaking in the sacraments, and really understanding the faith and why Jesus came to teach us. So you might be thinking, all right, Deacon's making all this stuff up because he's got so much idle time when he's sitting at work. So I thought I'd come up with just a few quotes to see that you know I just didn't pull this uh, out of thin air. You might remember back in 97 where Mother Teresa spoke at the prayer breakfast in front of the Clintons and basically hammered them for being pro-abortion, right? They had to stand there and listen to this little diminutive nun basically chastise them, right? She had courage. She didn't care who was there or what their beliefs were. She was going to speak the truth. And if you read anything about Mother Teresa, she hated public speaking, right? That was the last thing she wanted to do, but she was more than willing to do it. What is taking place in America, she said, is a war against the child, and if we accept that, the mother can kill her own child. How can we tell other people not to kill one another? How do we? Right? If life is the preeminent issue, and we're going to have people say, and we'll get there in a minute, oh, well, you just can't be a one-issue person. Well, here's the deal. Life is preeminent because if we don't have life, then we don't, none of the other subjects matter. And people say, well, what about immigration and the dignity of the immigrant? Well, that's great. But if you're allowing children to be torn apart in their mother's womb at 26 weeks or whatever it is, which happens in Boulder all the time, right, with the, with the abortionist Lauren Hearn up there, um, then you have no credibility. That'd be like taking marriage advice from somebody who abuses his wife. Why would you? You wouldn't take any advice from them because you think they're a loser. Right? They don't know what they're talking about. We need to make sure that life is the preeminent issue. Right? Archbishop Salvatore Corleone talks about life, marriage, and religious liberty are not only foundational to Catholic social teaching, but also fundamental to a good society. Right? This is common sense. This isn't rocket science. But this is a reminder to each and every one of us that we need to defend these things. Because if we want a solid society, if we want good, solid adults, parents, then we have to promote this stuff. And then Pope Paul VI, the right of the human person to religious freedom is to be recognized in the constitutional law whereby the society is governed. Religious liberty is critical. There's this thing that went past the Congress this past year called the Equality Act. Luckily, it didn't get a vote in the Senate. It would strip all religious freedom in every aspect of our life. And it got passed in the, House, in the Congress. If the election goes in a bad way, then it could become law in this country. Now, they tried to use the judiciary or the Supreme Court as a legislative body, which is not what it's supposed to be. So they did that when I mentioned about uh, Clayton County, or Bostock versus Clayton County, that, that legalized uh, transgender rights in employment law. 
They want to do it throughout everything. I encourage you to look up the Equality Act. It really should be called the Inequality Act. And how many knucklehead Catholics supported it? Right? Religious, free, religious liberty isn't, you know what, hey, pick the five of the Ten Commandments you feel comfortable with and you can go share those. Religious liberty is not, hey, you can do whatever you want in the walls of the church, but when you leave there, you're not supposed to say anything. That's what they want. That's what, that's what some of the people running for election this year want. We need to make sure that we understand it and that the church we know understands it, that we have the confidence to go out and share this stuff. Because it's critical, as I mentioned. <clears throat> sure it is. Sure it is. If you're going against the teaching of the church, right, if you're creating your own truths, right, that's the evil one. And people buy it hook, line, and sinker. You know, I always like to imagine the, the devil sitting on a sofa with his feet up on a coffee table, smoking a cigar, thinking, I can't believe these people bought this stuff. All I had to do was put it in their head, and they have taken it and run farther than I would have ever thought. Because we have so-called smart people who are buying the, mo the, the most ludicrous thoughts and, te and their own truth. So as I mentioned before, look, the hierarchy of goods. Life is number one. Not climate control like a bishop in San Diego seems to think. Life is number one. Marriage and family between a man and a woman, period. Religious freedom. Those are the three foundational issues. Right? Everything else is going to build upon it, whether it's immigration, universal health care, helping the poor, climate change, you know, minimum wage. You could throw anything else you want on there. But in the end, those are the top three things that we should hold every politician against. I don't care what our thoughts are on immigration. And the difference between these three and everything else that follows, there is no negotiating on these three. Right? Reasonable people could look at an immigrant, could look at the immigration system and say, okay, all right, everybody's getting in, nobody's getting in, or we can come somewhere in the middle, right? We can come to some kind of consensus on what immigration law should look like. Climate change. Right? Oh my gosh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, right? They neglect to say most of the fires that are going on out west have been started by Black Lives Matter and Antifa people, right? That's not climate change. But the point is, climate change and take care of the planet, okay, look, yeah, we shouldn't be doing stupid stuff. But that's not a preeminent issue, right? The other thing is, you know, we have weather history for what, like 100 years? May give or take, maybe a little more. How long has the Earth been here? Like a billion? That's such a small sample size. Yet we are we are saying everything is based on what these scientists say. Now, what to do with the climate? What to do with the planet? Reasonable people could come up with reasonable ideas, right? You can understand that. There isn't an absolute like life begins at conception and ends at natural death. We do not play God. As I said before, marriage is between a man and a woman, period. There's no negotiation there. Well, you know, everybody should have love, and why should people be penalized if, you know, they struggle with that? Look, we all have crosses, right? If we want to defend marriage between a man and a woman, that tells us how much we love children. Because when children aren't raised with a mom and a dad, it's a train wreck. Now, I'm, you know, sometimes that happens. Situations happen in our lives. I have it in my own family. But God knew the ideal situation was to have a mother and a father. Right? When kids grow up without a father in the home, they're more likely to drop out of school. They're more likely to be in poverty. They're more likely to be in jail. Those are the stats. This isn't, you know, somebody's just making this stuff up. This is the way it is. Uh, Girls are more likely to get pregnant in high school. All these things matter. So to say it doesn't matter whether they have two moms or two dads. Look, we all know a mom's a mom and a dad's a dad, right? You can't be a mom and a dad. And a dad can't be a mom no matter what they dress like or what they think they are. Perfect example, when my daughter was in college, 
One time she came to me, she goes, Dad, you know what I like about you and Mom? I'm like, oh, great, here we go. Right? Another slap on Pop, which I probably deserve anyway. But she goes, look, when I want to kick in the pants, I come to you. And when I want to hug, I go to Mom. And I know when I need either one. We're different. Children need a mom and a dad. There is no negotiating on that. Look at, look at what's happened to our children today. My wife was just, uh, we signed our grandson up for uh, karate. And I guess the instructor, the lady who owns it, um, had, her, had her child there. Well, the child didn't look like anything like the mom. And my wife's like, oh, she must look like her husband. She goes, no, I don't have a husband. I decided to do this on my own. I just wanted to have a kid. Right? That is called selfish. Right? That's not in the best interest of a child. That's keep treating a child like a commodity. And when children are treated like commodities and they don't have that love between a mom and a dad, it's a struggle. It doesn't mean they can't turn out all right, but the odds are against them. And it's all because we as, we as adults think we can you know, just buy them off the shelf. Right? We'll, we'll pick and choose what kind of traits we want or what the dad look like. We don't even need a dad. That's why we need to defend marriage. And we do that by living faithful marriages ourselves and encouraging our children and anybody around us to do the same thing. And I mentioned religious freedom. You don't get to pick and choose which freedoms we like. And that goes for any faiths, right? We ought to be defending any faith, whether it's the Mormon faith, whether it's the Muslim faith. People should be able to live their faith out in the public square without the government telling us what we should do and how we should do it. Right? When we get into socialism and communism, right, religion becomes the enemy. And we have people who think that's a good idea right now. Remember, when we went through the primaries here in Colorado, they voted for a democratic socialist slash communist. Bernie Sanders is who won the poll here. And he's an unabashed socialist and communist fraternizer. Right? They hate the faith because that takes away from the government. And we need to make sure we understand that. So any questions on any issues that you believe that I have out of order here? Really, this is the first three. The rest are kind of at random. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. When you talk about Antifa and BLM starting the fires in California, mm -hmm. that's the first time I've heard that. So yeah. Where does that come from? Uh, I've seen it on TV. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm, well, I don't have TV. I've seen it online. They're throwing these Molotov cocktails. Right? They're lighting fires, not only in the city, but out in Portland. They've actually arrested a couple people. Right? Now, I'm not saying every fire is like that, but look, stuff happens. Right? You have fires every year, but you have these people who are doing whatever they want. That's called anarchy. And everybody's afraid to do it. Actually, and I didn't watch the debate last night, so I'm going to you know, paraphrase what I heard, that Antifa is more of a theory than a group. Right? That's asinine, right? I mean, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, and I know that's stupid. I mean, that's the type of people we have running who want to run our country. We're denying the reality of Antifa, uh, Antifa, right? Father knows we were at Broomfield Library praying because of a drag queen story time, and Antifa showed up. I don't think that was a theory. I think they were real people getting in our face, yelling and screaming, trying to pick fights. Like, they're just a bunch of punks who want to see anarchy reign. And you know what? If they ever got what they really asked for, they'd be crying to their mamas. They would hate it. They're just angry people. We need to pray for them. Any other questions? Yeah. So I've heard an argument when I have for my life. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't buy that argument, but I mean, it, 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 it's hard to conceive that because children are neglected by their parents, and look, there's knucklehead parents, right? I mean, I got, I got a knucklehead parent in my family. That doesn't mean I should be able to rip a baby apart or kill a child 
who, oh, by the way, God is the author of life, not us, right? And by the way, there are, I can't even count the number of people that are trying, that can't have children that want to adopt. Literally. I mean, I have young couple, I have young people who work for me who can't, they can't get pregnant, there's some medical issues, and I've seen it across the board. Do you know how hard it is to adopt a child? I mean, you almost have to cut your right arm off and maybe your left pinky. And then they'll consider you. So we need, you know, look, if we want to, if we want to change that, then let's change how, peop how people can adopt, right? What is, what is this, what are they saying about uh, Amy Coney, Coney Barrett? Right? What are they saying? Because she adopted two children from Haiti, right? They're blasting her for that. I mean, people are irrational and they don't think things through. But it is, it is an argument, and I've heard it before. But look, let's change the adoption laws, right? Let's make it easier for people who desperately want to have a child. And it is painful to watch somebody, you know, who doesn't have common sense to, you know, be able to tie their shoes, who can get pregnant at the drop of a hat, yeah. right? I mean, it just doesn't... And then you've got the, the two men that get babies right away, or two women, you know, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, money talks, right? If you're, right? if you're wealthy and can do things. But the bottom line is, look, you can look at Catholic Charities. They, they, you know, they're getting taken out of the adoption business because they're trying to force them to adopt to same-sex couples. We see it going on. So you can't have it both ways. Well, nobody's taking care of the little kids who have bad homes. And you make it so you can't, right? Or you take away the faith communities, which are the communities that do all the work, by the way. You know, whether it's Lutheran Family Services or Catholic Charities, I mean, just name them. And then say, well, then that, that's reason enough to kill children. You know, it's, it's, it's an irrational argument uh, that we're going to take innocent life created by, you know, by our creator, as like we all were, because some, children is, some child is treated poorly, who, you know, given the right system, would probably be able to be adopted. Sure. Well, the comer you're jumping ahead on me, but I'll let you. I'll let you go. I am going to talk about that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the first ad that came out was a rabbi and his wife. That's who it is. Right? There was a fetal anomaly, and I'm so lucky we had the choice. Basically, I'm so you know, it's like mom saying, "I'm so lucky I had the choice to kill my child." That's right. It's hard to get through to that. I mean, in the end, you know, we just have to. We have to be a model. We have to be able to try to articulate it. Some people, it's going to take a while. We just got to keep praying for them, but doesn't mean we give in. Were you going to say something? Yeah, we I haven't heard the word mortal sin for many years. Okay, that's this to kill a baby is a mortal sin that puts your soul in jeopardy. You know what I mean? Uh, well, there's this thing called "Thou shalt not kill," yeah, one of the Ten yeah, Commandments, yeah. right? Yeah, I, and by, by the way, "Thou shalt not commit adultery." Uh, what are you doing if you're not in a marriage between a man or a woman? Right? What are you doing if you're partaking in sexual activity? So yeah, I mean, in the end, now here's the deal: if you're talking to non-Catholics. And you're going to, oh, you're going to hell. You got mortal sin. They're going to be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So one, we need to be able to articulate that. But we need to articulate the beauty. What, what do moms and dads give to a child? Right? Why is life the preeminent issue? And why should we talk about that? So we have to be able to talk on both spheres. We have to be able to talk to people who don't have faith and people who do. But there, look, there are churches that are promoting Proposition 115. Right? I've seen them go and bless a Planned Parenthood. Right? These people are off their rocker. But we need to be, we shouldn't be voting for those type of people. And unfortunately, we got plenty of those that, that are around the system. And well, they've got Black Lives Matter right on their window down there. Had a big plan are you going to jump ahead again? <laughs> you're no longer able to come to any more present. You're banned for the next one. I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> I got a theory. Catholics, before. Uh, Vatican II, okay? We used to talk about heaven, hell, judgment, okay? Heaven, hell, hell. And we said it, okay? And the people that were Catholics, they heard us, even they didn't believe hell, but they, they, they saying, well, you know, it was a sort of back in your back of the head, not on your front, you know, front burner, you know? That's, that's my theory. You know, that they don't, we don't even talk about hell. Well, we do we need to talk hell. about it. You know, we have to be careful. You know, we can't, you know, judge somebody that they're going to hell, no. right? That's not our job. 
right? We're just working out our salvation, right? What St. Paul tells us, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We do need to share the truth, though, right? If you remember a couple weeks ago, 27, I forget what Sunday it was, Ezekiel, the Lord's talking to Ezekiel, and he's like, hey, I'm asking you to go tell those people who are not doing what they're supposed to the truth. Because here's the deal. If you don't, not only will they be condemned, but I'm coming after you too because you didn't share the truth with them. We are called to do the same thing. And whether people believe it or not, that's totally up to them. But it can't be because we were afraid to speak the truth because then our souls are going to be in jeopardy too. Lord, I was afraid they weren't going to like me. Lord, I was afraid that I don't think is going to cut the mustard on Judgment Day. I might be wrong, but to say we were afraid to tell the truth, which is basically to share Jesus Christ, does not sound like a good reason. to me. So we do. We need to be able to share the truth. Now, we have to be able to do it based on our audience, too. Right? The first time you meet somebody, you go, oh, you better not do that or you're going to hell. That conversation probably is not going to go too much farther than that. Sometimes you have to develop a relationship with somebody be able to have those conversations. So there's not one size fits all. There's not a book that says, okay, if they say this, then say that. We have to be able, you know, God gave us, you know, a brain, an intellect, and we have to be able to use that in a way to be able to articulate to people. And like, there's some people who are never going to listen to us, right? If we have family members, and I do, right? Anytime I say them, I'm sure it's like, wah, wah, wah. They're not listening to anything I say. You pray that the Lord sends somebody else to talk to them. Because we're not going to get through to everybody. Christ didn't get through to everybody, even though he tried, right? Scribes, Pharisees, they ended up killing him anyway, crucifying him anyway, so it didn't matter. So the other thing, we need to make sure what has happened, just look in the last few months, you know, since the, you know, the great pandemic, uh, assaults on life, marriage, religious liberty, uh, just what's been going on since early March. And what have these people done and what have they said? Right? We've had people closing down the churches. I mentioned before, pot shops, liquor stores, grocery stores, abortion clinics, all those were open. We had to shut down the churches. Right? Our governor thought this was the greatest thing in the world. Right? He had no problem doing that. Elections have consequences. Right? We're trying to create more financial dependence. Let's just throw money at everybody. Right? That'll fix the problem. Right? In the end, they want to create a dependency. Right? Where is, hey, how about getting a job and earning your own keep? And look, if you need a little help, okay, great. This was an extenuating circumstance. But they're talking about trillions of dollars to just to hand out to people. And I know people who get this shouldn't get a penny. But they're getting it. Right? Calls to eliminate police. And I'm sorry, I got a funky color here, so it's not really showing up. But there's this, uh, there's a city council person in Denver. Her last name is Setabaka. She is basically uh, a professed communist. Right? She wanted to eliminate the police. Right? We're going to take away their guns, and we're not going to allow them to arrest anybody. How safe do you think we would be with lunatics like that running what's going on? Right? It's already bad. Now, mercifully, the mayor and the other city council people are like, no, we're not doing that. But I don't know if you just saw, the, the city council in Minnesota is all of a sudden asking, and I've read this a couple different times, why is crime going so much? What's going on? What are you doing, police? Right? After they chastise them, take away some of their funding, and then they want to know why things are going to hell in a handbasket. It makes zero sense. But these are people that have got elected. She just got elected. This is her first term. And she ran, not necessarily de defunding police, but she ran basically on a communist agenda. She doesn't think there should be private property. And she got voted in. This is the kind of thing that's going on in our world. Right? Attacks on the family, abortion. You know, there was just, uh, I saw something two weeks ago. They were doing a GoFundMe thing in Utah to raise money, $5,000, to send a woman here so she could have Dr. Hearn, I think it was Dr. Hearn, kill her baby. She, so they're doing money to be able to do that. And everybody thinks, hey, that's great. You know, anything we can do to help them out, right? There's politicians that think that's good. We have Black Lives Matter, right? They target the nuclear family. They want to get rid of the patriarchy was on their website. You know, they just recently scrubbed that website, too. They took off some of the communist thought because everybody is like, what is this? But people still donate. I don't know how many Black Lives Matter signs I saw coming over here. Right? We had politicians bending a knee 
in Washington, D.C. and other places, and Catholic leaders, I'm afraid to say, bending the knee at Black Lives Matter. Right? It is a Marxist operation that wants to get rid of the nuclear family, wants to get rid of the patriarchy, and it wants to promote LBGTQ rights. Yet people are bowing to them, right? We hear, bend the knee at the name of Jesus. I don't remember seeing Black Lives Matter when I read the scriptures last time. But it is an anarchy that is continues to be seen. People are donating money hand and fist over this. But basically, what they are promoting, as I mentioned earlier in the beginning, it's cultural Marxism, right? Let's have the races against each other. Let's have the sexes against each other. Let's mute it so the sexes don't even mean anything, right? They create anarchy. And then the other one, it's uh, almost cut off. But look, we see restrictions on social media, right? If you don't agree with Facebook or Twitter and you don't agree with some of the left-wing agendas, your stuff gets pulled. Right? You can't even get it on there. We're, how is that free speech? And we have politicians who think that's great. They think Black Lives Matter is great. We shouldn't vote for those people. So we need to make sure that we understand, you know, just look at our world. Don't listen to what the media says, and I'm sure we don't hear it, but we need to remind other people, the media is full of garbage. They're like, hey, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And people buy it hook, line, and sinker. So media, entertainment, we need to see for ourselves. Look, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. right? I don't care what they say on the news media or whatever. <clears throat> and I need to pick up the pace here because I'm spending way too much time. Uh, so we need to talk, again, as I mentioned before, elections have consequences. Right, subsidiary at the lowest level. We need to make sure that all elections matter. Even city council members, mayors, you know, who's getting on the school boards? Because this is where a lot of the people that have risen have infiltrated. They start at the lower levels and they work their way up. Right? We, I've been in Lafayette and I've been in Broomfield for these drag queen story times. City council thinks it's great. Mayors think it's great. If you, look on the, if you look on the library website, the main objective is to teach children three through six gender fluidity. Right? This isn't, hey, so that we can make sure nobody gets, you know, nobody gets discriminated against. It is an outright agenda that is supported by a lot of these lower level elected officials. We cannot ignore them. It's gonna keep happening and happening. And we need to encourage, this is where good people can start running. Look what's going on in our schools. Right? It's an indoctrination camp. These schools are not a place of learning, it's a place of indoctrination if you look at public schools. Right? House Bill 1032 about transgender ideology got passed not this session, the session before. Right? There is a clause that you have to notify parents if it's a formal class, but any teacher in any public school can talk about transgender ideology without notifying the parents. Unless it's a particular presentation and then they let them know. These things matter and we can't, you know, the president, hey, that's important. But most of the things that affect us are, are that's why subsidiary at the lowest level at our local communities, that's where a lot of the subversion and garbage is going on. And we cannot ignore those things. All right, here's my small section on Prop 115, just because everyone here I know will vote yes. I do have signs in the back with stands, if anybody wants to take one. And I encourage everybody to take one, put it in your yard if you have a yard. Um, right, this is the preeminent issue. Now I've had some people say, look, you can't negotiate. It's either no abortions or nothing. Well, look, we need to understand the state that we're living in. I mentioned before, Governor, Secretary of State, Attorney General, all these are promoting abortion. Right? We are the first state in the country in 1967 to allow unlimited abortions up until the minute of birth. More than 40 states have restrictions. Colorado, eh, we're not one of them. More, 70 to 80 percent of people nationally in Gallup polls believe that we, there should not be third, part, third trimester abortions. This is common sense. Most people believe these things. 
we need to make sure that we are defending life. And in the end, we want to eliminate all abortions, but we have to start somewhere. Planned Parenthood is so worried they're spending $7 million. They started yesterday with their ad campaign. Their poll is showing this at a 50-50 split right now. If you can imagine Planned Parenthood losing their flagship state on abortion, a blue state on top of that after having spent $7 million, and I've been on, you know, we get on some of their calls periodically. They know the judiciary is not their friend and it's going against them, right? We've had almost in this last administration, what, two or 300 judges approved that have gotten through. They do not want this to go to the courts. We need to make sure that we're yelling this from the mountaintops that this needs to pass. And I think it will. Matter of fact, I know. We'll, we'll, in November 4th, we're going to be very happy, and the other side is going to be furious. Because they're going to have outspent us 10 to 1. But the grassroots effort, people's enthusiasm is huge. So, all right, that's my... Why did they put in the exception for life of the mother? Because they just said that expected testimony. And the doctors are going to say, oh, well, I had to save the mother. And so the well, they have, to be able to, they have to be able to prove it, right? So they need another doctor to corroborate it. And here's the deal on the life of the mother. No doctor at 22 weeks or beyond would do an abortion to save the life of the mother. It could be up to a four-day process. Right? You would deliver the child. So I think that got put in there. And the bishops agreed. Right? I mean, in the end, we didn't, we didn't put incense. We didn't put rape. They didn't put those type of things in there. But they wanted, and actually Planned Parenthood is saying there's no exceptions anyway. So I guess it doesn't even matter. But in reality, no one would ever do that. And we want to make sure that we try to get the best opportunity to get this passed. So that's why that was allowed in there. Um, but here's the deal. You know, people say, well, that, you shouldn't have any exceptions. Well, really, when you're saying 22 weeks, you're making an exception to 21 weeks, right? I mean, at some point, you have to make a prudential judgment on how do we save as many babies? Because this would save about two to 300 babies a year here in Colorado. And it would limit people coming here to have these abortions. Oh, really? Two to three hundred. That, that we know that were reported. And we got that from the health department here. Yeah. That new ad makes a point of saying that uh, 115 does not allow for uh, abortion because of incest or rape. Correct. That is true. I would assume. Yeah, I mean that, and with any of these, it, it would, right? I mean, even with fetal abnormality, most, you know, they, they know that pretty early on. Uh, this is really what they're saying is it's a ban on abortion. So they're not even, they, they know the stats that people don't want abortion in late term trimester, right? Or our third trimester. So yeah, they're doing that, and they're, you know, they're 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 playing fast and loose with the words, but in the end. Look, a child conceived in rape or incest is a child. They're not a criminal. And I interviewed a woman who was conceived in rape. Um, you know, and her mom tried to have an abortion, but she, was, this was in Michigan, and she was born in the late 60s. Um, yeah, I mean, we care about the life of a child. So our vernacular is, look, moms and babies. We're not talking, because they like to say it's women and a, and a fetus. You know, they try to separate the relationship. We need to make sure that we stick to it. And we don't get into the exceptions. All we're saying is, look, moms are heroes, and we need to make sure that we protect moms and babies. Because the minute you start talking about the exceptions, then they take you off the point, and that's where support goes down. So they're going to play those all day long. Um, and, and we've already seen that, and it started yesterday. OK. Socialism, communism, Look, they're two sides of an ugly coin. Uh, you know, people say, well, socialism will work, especially democratic socialism. Right? You put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. I don't care what you call it. You know, the premise of socialism is just ugly. Like, and if you want, a, you want a real life example, look at Venezuela. It was one of the richest countries in South America. This is actually a picture that I pull off the internet of people eating out of a garbage truck because they can't find food, right? All those socialism and communism, what they do is create huge poverty, right? There's shortages on everything. 
So no matter how, all the natural resources that Venezuela had is now, you know, hasn't helped anybody. Um, and the other thing is, if you look at the, uh, if you go online, I think the average Venezuelan has lost 15 or 20 pounds since socialism took over, right? And if you're against socialism, what do they do? They, tr they lock you up, right? They don't like any, anybody who speaks against them, right? We, what they do is they treat people as a means to an end, right? So they're basically a cog in the machine. There is no inherent dignity in an individual because it's all about the government. Right, the government decides what's best for you. They'll tell you where, you're, where you can live. Right? They want to take away private property. There is none, or they want to take it away. Right? They want to tell you how you can educate your kids. They, they know how best to educate your kids better than we do. Right? It takes all the controls away. It takes the rights away of people. And what it does is it, it basically takes the means of production. Right? They steal from the rich keep a bunch for themselves and then give some shekels out to the poor. So if you were in Venezuela, a doctor is going to make the same amount as a garbage man because they believe that's fair, that's equitable. Right? Every country, if you look at what happened in the 20th century under socialism and communism, over 100 million people were killed. Whether you look at Stalin and what happened in Russia, whether you look at Pol Pot, whether you look at Mao Zedong, you look at Look at all the, the death that transpired because of that. And oh, by the way, we have to take religion out of the equation because we can't have any competition, right? We can't have a religion that understands that human dignity is, is something to be held up because the human is just a cog in the machine. And that's what we've seen over and over and over again. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ayn Rand. She was actually an atheist uh, from Russia. She wrote uh, When Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead, if you've ever read any of those. But she said the difference between communism and socialism is merely the difference between murder and suicide. Right? Socialism, people choose right? because they make it look so good. And that's what we're seeing in our world today. Right? We have a lot of people with, who, want, who think socialism, whether you're AOC or any of those politicians, because they, they know better. So people do it, and then they hate it. Communism is more forced upon people, so that's the difference. I thought it was a good analogy uh, that she had. And then you can look at uh, you know Saul Alinsky, right, the father of community organizing, right, who happened to be uh, you know somebody Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama looked up to, right. What they want to do is create class warfare, right. They want to create. Uh, a society where it's in total upheaval so that they can come in. Right? I just finished a book, and I think it's on, the, on some of the references. Uh, a guy named Paul Kengel wrote it. It's called uh, The Devil and Karl Marx. Highly recommend it. Uh, but it goes through how, really in the 20th century, how the communists tried to infiltrate the Protestant churches, the Catholic churches, how they did, uh, you know, teachers' unions, even even our government officials. It's really interesting to read uh, how that progressed and where and how we got to where we are today. Right? We've never become a communist country, but it's not from lack of effort. It's because this has been a concerted effort throughout time. I mean, um, uh, School of Darkness. I forget the uh, Bella Dodd claims that she got a thousand seminarians when she was part of the Communist Party uh, into American seminaries in like the 30s and the 40s. Um, and look at look at some of the problems we got. It's not hard to believe that that might happen. Now, how many made it all the way through to the priesthood? She was just talking about getting those in there. Um, that's kind of, I mean, look, this is very divisive. And, you know, it isn't that the church fell asleep on this issue. So the Communist Manifesto came out in, I believe, 1848, right? The Pope started writing about this in 1846. So they knew, they smelled a rat right off. And I have uh, one of the references is a bunch of different Pope, uh, quotes from different popes. But Pope Pius IX was the one who wrote it in, 18, uh, in 1846. This one he wrote a couple of years later. Uh, just, you know. You're aware, indeed, that the goal of this most iniquitous plot is to drive people to overthrow the entire order of human affairs and to draw them over to the wicked theories of socialism and communism 
by confusing them with perverted teachings. Isn't that what we're seeing today? Right? We have revisionist history. Right? We don't even teach kids history. These people look up to Stalin like he's some kind of hero. Right? He was a mass murderer. But what's happening in our college education system, uh, not to mention our, you know, pri our uh, secondary education system, is criminal. So if you look at Karl Marx and Frederick Engel, who wrote the Communist Manifesto, they both had faith until they went to college. And then it all went, I mean, the evil one took over. And that's what we're seeing today on our college campuses. People are paying thousands of dollars to send their kids to be corrupted. And a lot of Catholic schools are just as bad. Right? You want to look at what good Catholic colleges are? Go to the Cardinal Newman Society. There's like 35, maybe not even that many, in the whole country. None of them are Jesuit. Right? Georgetown, Loyola, all these are garbage pits. Right? And they're, what they're doing is brainwashing kids. Right? They have LBGTQ groups. It's ridiculous. Uh, Leo the thir uh, the thirteenth, communism, socialism, nihilism, hideous deformities of a society of men, and uh, who all, uh, society of men and almost its ruin. So the church has been speaking out about this. So when people say, "Hey, you know, Jesus was a socialist," or the church is good with this, look at them like they have three heads because they don't have a clue what they're talking about. Right? It's stuff that's being passed on that's not true. And we need to see, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter, where they were, they were uh, self-professed Marxists. Right? That's where they got their training. They were proud to talk about it. What are our elected officials saying? Do they what do they believe about socialism and communism? You know, like people like to say, well, what about Sweden? Sweden's capitalist. Right? They do socialized medicine and different things. But is it a capitalistic system? They tried it. And they almost went totally under. Their economy went right in the toilet many years ago. It's a capitalist system, but people like to use that as, an, as a success story. And they, again, most people don't even know what they're talking about. They're just regurgitating what they've heard. And so we need to be able to speak clearly on these things. Okay, we're wrapping it up. Right out about an hour, and we'll take some questions. But we need to find out about our candidates. So the Colorado Catholic Conference just put out a voter's guide that would be helpful to look at. Uh, it also has stuff on Prop 115. But you know, who is my representative? There's a way to go. You go on their site, you can type in your address, it'll tell you your representative, all the way from the president to your local elected officials. Because people say, I don't know who my elected officials are. Well, there's no excuse not to know. Go on their websites and look on YouTube, type in their name, see what they're saying. What are they doing? Go on their websites. Who is funding them? Right? If they have a 100% rating from NARAL, which is now Cobalt here in the, in the, so don't let their name fool you. In Colorado, they changed their name just this past year. You know, if they're getting funded by the marijuana industry, if they're getting funded by particular groups, you know, it's not hard to figure out what side they're on. Look at their voting record. So you can go to a website, find out their voting record. And then call them, email them. Go visit them. I've done it. It's not that big a deal. Sometimes people get uh, intimidated. They work for us. We put them in there. They're not gods. They are people who we elected to represent us. And maybe we didn't even vote for them, but they need to hear from us. Because here's the deal. If 10 Catholics showed up at a town hall meeting, they'd fall out of their chair. They wouldn't even know what to say. We need to make sure our voice is heard and that we have the courage to do it. And these are just some ways, some ways to do it. But again, call, email, and look. Don't tell them they're going to hell when the first time you meet them. Have a conversation. Be able to art, you know, articulate why you believe what you believe and that there's a lot of people who vote like me. And we have those conversations. Because in the end, we're trying to save souls. Right? People who don't agree with us are not the enemy. Those are souls that need to be saved. And we need to make sure that we keep that in the back of our mind because it's easy to get angry and want to strangle them. But in the end, we need to speak the truth in love, and we need to speak the truth and see we don't want them going to hell. It's not our judgment whether they are, but we need to try to help them see the error of their ways. So have good conversations with them. 
I'm actually having a conversation right now, and I've been waiting for a call for two days, so I probably shouldn't hold my breath, uh, for a Democratic legislature, le legislator to come out and, and support 115 publicly and make a statement. They're thinking about it. They're praying about it. I've, had a con I've known this person for probably three years, and we're trying to get him to do it this week or next. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But had we not built a relationship three years ago, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, and they wouldn't even be praying about it. So I think the bottom line is we are responsible. Ladies responsible. Clergy, everybody's responsible. We can't just say, you know, we're lucky we're at a great parish, right? We got, we got father, deacon, we got people preaching the truth. Not everybody has that. I was told yesterday by a parishioner of a parish not too far from here, that they will not use the yes on 115 cards because we can't tell people how to vote. This came from the pastor. By the way, this pastor also said I could not do this presentation at his church because it would disrupt his congregation. It was too controversial. We gotta stand up, right? We gotta stand up and make sure we speak the truth. It is on us, because every night we go to bed, we wake up in the morning, we look in the mirror, it's on us. And we need to make sure that we are defending the truth, we're sharing the truth, and we're voting based on the truth. It's critical and it's required. And so, you know, part of what we're doing, I'm talking at all the deacon uh, regional meetings, I have another one Saturday. How do we talk about elections? What about responsibility and voting? Guiding principles? Uh, you know, non-negotiables. So we've offered that, you know, we provided all the talking points from 115 to the archdiocese. Uh, you know, the Archbishop of Quill has asked all parishes to preach on it the next two weekends on 115. They just came out with a magazine on religious freedom. But we need to encourage and we need to remind people that this is it. But even if they don't listen to us, it doesn't exonerate us from our responsibility. We got to do it. Because in the end, we got to look in that mirror every morning and say, have I spoken the truth? Have I done what the Lord is asking me to do? Period. Right? Not, we can't look around and, and start blaming people. It's us. And so if people didn't vote for idiots, we wouldn't have idiots in office. But people vote for them. They don't just, you know, poof, show up. We need to make sure we start turning the tide. And it's not going to change overnight. It's going to take a long, it took us, you know, 50, 60, 70 years to get to this point, right? You can, you can start tracing this back to the 30s and 40s. You know, everybody thinks that was the golden time, but there was a lot of garbage going on, a lot of bad stuff that is now manifesting in, in ways people ne would have never thought. Okay, that's it. I just have, I do have some resources. Anybody who wants this, I can, I'll send this PowerPoint to anybody. I don't care if you guys want to look at it just to get the referral sources and the things that we have on there. Um, but, you know, anything Archbishop Fulton Sheen wrote, great stuff, very clarity. I mean, it's like he's living today, the way he's written those things. Um, we've done a few shows on socialism. Uh, we've talked about this kind of stuff. So I have a lot more resources. I just put a few up there. Um, any questions? And I've been Neville and Karl Marx is in the Denver Catholic that just came out. Oh, is it? Nice article. Oh, I mean, it was a good article. So, so you know, I want to. I'm trying to get more than five listeners to my show, so I will we'll plug it tomorrow. He, I, I interviewed him, so he's going to play uh, tomorrow on Catholic Radio, and then we'll post it on our website. Um, really sharp guy, good guy. Actually, the first time I interviewed him on another topic, he he teaches at Grove City College in uh, Pitt, just outside Pittsburgh. He was literally being chased by Black Lives Matter people on campus. They were trying to get him kicked out of the school. Because he wrote an article about a Dominican who was in habit, in, I think at Indiana University, who, who someone called the police on because they said there was a KKK member walking on campus. So he had written this, but then he was being accused by Black Lives Matter as a white supremacist. I mean, it was crazy. you know. Uh, Different groups had to come to his support. Um, good guy, really knows what he's talking about. But anyway, these are just some resources. You're going to say something, Richard? Uh, you mentioned Planned Parenthood is spending seven million dollars to defeat 115. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see ads supporting it? 
Uh, well, you know, it's funny because all of our big donors have not contributed. So we've raised several hundred thousand. We will be doing digital ads for, to, uh, focused on uh, independents and Democrats. Uh, we've heard that's, that's how money's, that you have much better chance of having a greater impact doing digital ads, whether you're on social media and all those things, because that's where most people are. Uh, but we have, we have a donor, I'm not gonna mention a name, who says, I wanna be the last donor in. Like, I wanna be the, the hero. Right, but I want to see who else has donated, what they've donated. I want you to do this, that, and the other thing. And I told the people that are talking to him, I said, hey, tell him to go take a flying leap. I don't need his money. Right, you're not telling us what to do. You want to help win or don't you? And unfortunately, enough people don't. Right? I don't think they think we can win. And we're going to win. So it's been, very, it's been disappointing on the financial side because we'd like to do some TV ads, not a lot, because they're really expensive. Uh, but we've talked, we, we've hired a, a marketing firm and we're st we've started this week uh, doing digital marketing. So we'll see how it pay plays out because that's how much money we raise. I'm getting phone calls to, to uh, go pro on, on 15th. Oh yeah, they got phone banks going. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we actually, it's funny, we actually, I had somebody come up to me and said, hey, I'm on their phone bank list and I'm calling people to say yes. So they've had some people like infiltrate their own <laughs> phone bank list. And uh, so that's funny. I'm sure they'll get caught sooner or later. But uh, they, they mentioned it at the uh, Eucharist procession on Saturday. I, I said, uh, just for the catechism, from a really sharp priest in Florida. He says, the devil, he, his main thing is just, he looks at God and he wants to imitate him, whatever he wants to do. But you know, I think he, this is my own theory. And he said, we have. He's got a lot of theories. I think he said, uh, Christ the king, a uh, king of all nations, right? So the devil, I think, this is a, he's a, I think the devil says, no, I'm uh, the devil of all nations, United Nations, communism, all this other stuff. I think that's what's happening. Okay. Well, look, here's the deal. The devil doesn't do anything unless somebody says yes, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, he's not, it's not, this isn't the invasion of the body snatchers where he takes over us, right? People have to say yes to him. And that's the problem, right? Too many people are buying his lies and doing his stuff, and in the end, you know what? When we get judged, it's not going to be the devil made me do it, Lord. No, we chose to do it. So we need to speak truth and, and hopefully get through to the hearts of these individuals and not vote for these people that believe those type of things. In the end, the control is, we have the power. We have the control. We have to use it. All right, any other questions? We have to remember that our commitment didn't work for Eve. Yeah. Didn't work for Eve? It ain't going to work for us? <laughs> no. Or, hey, it was my husband here, what the heck, right? Or no, the husband was like, hey, it was Eve's fault, I didn't do anything, right? Passing the buck is never gonna work. The buck stops with us, and it does with everything, right? We get to make our own decisions. And we have, and you know what, we have the ability, by following the Lord through prayer, through study, to make the right decisions and to share that with people. And if we don't, that's on us, that's not on anybody else, even the devil. All right, any other questions? All right, signs are free. Thank you. Thank you. Grab one, yeah, grab a steak.